This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Engineers are about making connections to make things function. Dr. Michael Andrews is an engineer who loves Jesus and he's written a book to help us with the engineering to better connect with others. He shares this insight from his book, The Influential Christian. Your first chapter, uh, Connecting Hearts, doesn't sound like something an engineer is going to get involved in. How did, how did you bridge that gap from your engineering brain over to something that's talking about empathy, connecting hearts, uh, listening to people rather than directing things? Uh, how did all that take place when you, I, it's like a second career here, right? You're right. You're absolutely right. Uh, empathy is hardly my native language. It is, as an engineer, that is it's not something that was innate for me. But I've always been a curious person, and I've always been interested in learning and teaching and helping other people teach. And so that's kind of the avenue through which I um, uh, started looking into these things because I was curious about it. What made it? What made people who were good influences tick? And um, I arrived at empathy being the, the key ingredient, and so began a search of how to, to do that. As far as myself, I've had some really good models in, in my life, and being kind of curious and, and a lifelong learner, I've, I've imitated some of those models. Uh, some were relatives, some were friends, some were business associates, um, but truly working with the church has been a second career for me in many ways. Well, you're talking about teaching teachers to become effective teachers. How did you arrive at that key that, that empathy is a real key, that they've got to, they've got to empathize with those people that they're teaching? Well, I, I have a number of friends around me who kind of help me think through that as uh, training teachers. What is it that's most important and how, how do we connect with other people? Well, empathy is, is the main way that we engage at a heart level with other people. Uh, people define empathy in a lot of different ways, but in general, it's the way we make connections and the way we value other people. And so I had some good friends who kind of helped me think through and talk through that subject to where uh, we arrived at, at that as being the focus. Well, this really began as a, as a doctoral dissertation, didn't it? I mean, the study of it? Yes, what, yes. Uh, I, I, I've been um, directing adult education and, and training teachers for many, many years. <clears throat> and recently, um, in the past few years, I was working on a doctor of ministry uh, program, a degree at uh, Duke Divinity School. And that helped a lot, really focusing in on what was needed for this subject. And so empathy became this focus then that we've got to begin to, and out of empathy, you can't empathize with somebody until you really begin to understand what the heart is, what their heart is, and what you're, and, and you're sharing that. So you really got to start someplace in that physical connection. You got to start by listening, right? Yes, that's right. We often talk about empathy as, as walking in somebody else's shoes, but it's more than that. It's more than just um, me walking in their shoes. It's understanding how it is for them to walk in their shoes. And when, when I do that, when people are heard and understood and valued, we begin to make a connection that we can relate to each other in new ways. Walking in their shoes, it, it, I mean, when you run into somebody who thinks there's no way you can understand what it's like to walk in my shoes because you don't share my ethnicity, you don't share my gender, you don't share my, my history, you don't share anything with me other than you've been listening to me a little bit, uh, how could, are, are people kind of, could they possibly be insulted by the fact you think I can try to see how they walk in their shoes? Um, I think if we start by asking questions rather than making propositions, uh, most people are, are disarmed and engaged and people want to talk about themselves. So when we ask questions, mm -hmm. what, what's it like? Uh, most people will answer in positive ways. Yeah. Well, it, it seems like listening has gotten more difficult in our society. I mean, there's a lot of noise in our society now, especially with the amount of time that people spend on these kinds of things. But uh, why has is, why is listening become so difficult in our society? I mean, to really listen with your heart to somebody else's heart. You're right. You're absolutely right. And that is a, a, a really question on point. Uh, we are such a culture of talking that listening offers a grace that is difficult for us to engage in. Um, we, we, want, we want to be heard. And, 
and we feel like there aren't people who are listening. So if somebody does start listening, if you or I start listening to somebody, the other person wants to talk. We are in a culture of talking. So that really starts the engagement. There's, there's this feeling sometimes that if I listen to you and I don't agree with you, I become the enemy, that your narrative is the only correct narrative and I must agree with it. How do we get around those kind of, we're going to jump into those presuppositions? Yeah, I don't have to agree with a person to value uh, their presence and their, um, their story. Um, and we need to hear other people's stories. Whether we agree with them or not is really not that important to start with. Uh, for the engagement to happen, when, once we engage with the person, we begin that dialogue, then we start to see the things that um, are mutually significant for us. Um, and the disagreements aren't quite as important. Uh, I think a lot of times we're afraid that we're going to have to compromise our position if we, if we listen and if we uh, engage in dialogue. And that's not true. Uh, when I engage with people in dialogue and listen and find out more about their story, it actually more often than not enriches my own perspective, mm -hmm. uh, helps me to see things in more ways than I did before, even about the things that I hold dear. It doesn't cause me necessarily to change the things that I hold dear, but it does enrich my understanding of them. Yeah. And you get these good examples when you look at, uh, look at uh, Christ and, 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 the, and the stories, not only the parables, but just his interaction with people that uh, he, wouldn't have, uh, he wouldn't have agreed with. I mean, he, he, he asked them questions. Yes, yes. He asked very good, open questions to allow people to explore their own, stu their own story and to um, open up. And, um, and he engaged with them. And, and gave them value and, uh, and a place. Yeah, I mean, when you, when you look at uh, Christ was always in a, in a, I wouldn't say a state of, of humbleness, but he, he walked with humility. Uh, he, he wasn't afraid to engage people. And a lot of times we look at empathy and we think, boy, if I start to empathize with this person, it gets real risky. I become responsible for what I've learned. Yes, yes, it is risky that way. Uh, it might mean that... Uh, there are things that we find out about ourselves that we need to examine. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that our whole um, house of beliefs is going to fall in, uh, but it does enrich the way that we think. Yeah. It, but does it require us then to, I've learned something about this person, now I've got to respond in some way. I've, there, there's, there's, some, there's some action requ required after I've, I've listened to this person, we've shared some things from our heart. Uh, I'm not just going to walk away cold. There, there might be right. some, might be some action, and sometimes that, that can get a little uh, uh, uncomfortable for people. Ultimately, the goal of what we're doing um, is to arrive at some action. Um, but I'm the kind of person that likes to jump to the quick fix if I can. <laughs> and, You're an engineer. And that, that, yes, yes, <laughs> and and I like to fix the problem. I like puzzles because I like to solve them. So when I'm discussing something with somebody. My natural inclination is to try and fix it, but yet that is not the best approach. The best approach is to think through why we're having the discussion and, and the meaningfulness and significance of the things we're talking about with the other person um, before we ever jump to a, a real active response. Generally, if we jump to the response quickly, it's the wrong response. Well, I've, I've heard that from my spouse <laughs> at times when I, I was sitting, was, right. she'd come home from work, <laughs> she'd come home from work and uh, uh, have a rough day and she's telling me about it and I would listen and listen. But my inclination is always, I'm supposed to fix this. And she didn't really want me to fix anything. She wanted me to listen and appreciate what she'd been through that day. Exactly, exactly. And, that, and that's a good image of what empathy looks like. Uh, in, in your experience, uh, I, I guess as you studied this, did you see changes in your, in your own uh, interactions with people? Yes, it has helped my um, interactions with my wife. I've been married for 43 years, so I've learned a lot over those, over those uh, years. And with other people, I've learned that dealing with difficult people um, is really only achieved through skills of empathy. Um, I will not influence someone with whom I'm in a difficult relationship, mm -hmm. unless I'm willing to engage with them and, and understand and value them. And that is really, really difficult. There are people to this day that I cannot have those kinds of conversations with, um, but it, I have grown to where 
Uh, there are more that I can. And, I, and people who are very different from me, uh, whether it be race or age or gender or, or whatever it might be, um, understanding where they're coming from, what their story is, is the first step toward really bridging the divides that we have. There's people in our lives that, uh, I don't want to say we, we, we know that we're never going to communicate with. We're never, we're, uh, it's hard to listen to them because they're your irregular person. They might be a, an in-law. They might be a, uh, they could be a, a relative, somebody at work. How do we, how do you, how do you uh, uh, kind of maneuver that, that area? It's it's not always easy, and that is a you know a question for our relationships. That's that's really important. Um, I think showing um, acts of empathy are are always helpful. We won't always we won't always connect with everybody that we try to engage with uh, because it's a mutual engagement that's important, yeah. and so both sides are important. But every time that I extend empathy, every time I extend valuing or listening or trying to understand the person as they see the world, it always helps. Um, it may not get all the way there. Uh, that may be for another time, but it always helps. Yeah. Uh, how do we, how do we kind of, I don't know what you want to signal, but how does that, does that speaker, the person that you're listening to, the speaker, do they need to know that you're understanding and appreciation, appreciating what they're saying? Uh, how do you, uh, how do you how do you communicate that to them that that you are you are seriously uh, trying to understand where they where they're coming from? Most people most people will know right away whether you really value them. That's something you can't really fake. Well, you know, I've, I've seen explanations of how to act like you're being empathetic by doing eye contact mm -hmm. and leaning forward and acknowledging what the person's saying. You know, if you really do value the people value the other person, you're going to do those things naturally because. Because you are interested, because you do value them. And I think that's the really big, hard first step, is finding a way to actually value the other person and the dialogue with yeah. them. Um, so. Yeah, I think we all, all recognize sometimes when somebody's trying to manipulate us and they're, and they're doing all the, the, all the gestures okay. and, and, and those things. And it, it, at that point, we know it becomes manipulation and, uh, and we're not really empathizing with the person. We just want to get our point across. We're thinking right. about the next thing we're going to say while we're, we're, we're actually looking at them, but we're not really listening. We're just forming our next, our next challenge to what they said. That, that's right. And, and real influence is not imposing myself on the other person. It's, it's engaging together in something that's yeah. mutual and reciprocal. Thanks to Michael for joining me today. And you can find his book, The Influential Christian, Learning to Lead from the Heart on Amazon and other online bookstores. After the break. The church and faith-based groups, we have kind of not known what to do with single moms and their families, and so we kind of haven't addressed it. Peggy Sue Wells shares a story with me today. That's coming up next on Viewpoint. My guest today found herself a single mom when her husband left her after many years of marriage. Peggy Sue Wells went on to raise her family and began writing books to encourage other single moms. She shares her story with me today. The 10 best decisions. How do you arrive at, first of all, there's only 10. There's only 10. <laughs> Yeah, and actually that was a spinoff with my co-author, Pam mm -hmm. Farrell, because Bill and Pam Farrell have written a lot of the 10 best decisions for parents and okay. yeah, singles. And I'm mm -hmm. like, what about single moms? Yeah. And so we put it together. But you've got things like decide to thrive, decide to be decisive, create a nurturing, nurturing home. And we can't go through all of it, but I've got a couple of questions here about on, on that, that uh, chapter right there. Uh, you're talking about emotions and the relationship glue if we stifle our emotions, if we shut them down, that, that it's okay to be angry. We're talking about people that have been through a whole lot as single moms 
and that you're giving them, uh, I guess, the, uh, the permission to, to exper experience their emotions. And God said, be angry and sin not. Anger mm -hmm. is not a bad thing. It's actually God's gift of extra adrenaline that we use then to right a wrong. Yeah. And so it's a good thing. And we get used to stuffing our emotions and that's not healthy either. But what happens with single moms and their kids is when you have that serious core relationship that blows apart, the moms and the kids go into trauma. And so we have trauma brain. And so the thinking part of our brain goes offline and we go back into fight, flight, freeze, or please. And that's mm -hmm. what we're operating out of. And so sometimes we'll look at single moms and we're like, what is she thinking? And we'll look at her kids and we're like, what are they thinking? And they're not. It's physically impossible they're because they're, they're, they're reacting. Because reacting. if you're like running from a bear or if you've got a fire, you want to react. And so we're back in trauma brain and trauma brain causes those type of odd reactions. Mm -hmm. And kids wind up down at the principal's office more often. And so that's the myth of mom, single moms are not good moms. But what's actually happening is the kids are in trauma and that's how it comes out. And so if they're with principals and teachers that understand bad behavior is not bad kids, it's bad behavior is broken hearts, then we can start yeah. making some progress. And if you look at the stats, 50% of kids. The, well, yeah, raising in a, in a single parent fa yeah. family. And you look at those stats and it's the same thing inside the church and outside the church. Uh, there's a lot of self-help books written. What gave you the, the I guess, the, the energy to do this and the, the background to do this? And at the same time, why is this one special? For a lot of the church and faith-based groups, we have kind of not known what to do with single moms and their mm -hmm. families, and so we kind of haven't addressed it. So being able to put this book together, I think was a big step forward because we really haven't known how to handle that. Um, my background for it is I'm the mom of seven children. Mm -hmm. And when the baby was- I should was, have said that in the, in, in the intro, <laughs> in the but I didn't want to give that away. Seven, seven kids, yeah. Nobody will believe that as they yeah. see you on television. <laughs> and with those seven, the baby was a year old when their dad chose out. And so that gave me her entire lifetime to you know, be a single mom. And so when I get to the end of it, I had some people say, you gotta write a book. And I'm like, I don't wanna necessarily be that single mom person, you know, that identity. And they said, well, you've done it a long time. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, like two decades. And they said, have you learned a few things? Do you know what works? I'm like, I know a ton of stuff that doesn't work. And I know a lot of good stuff that does work. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to put the tips that work into this book. I'm going to put all the good stuff, all the things that will help you be successful into this book. There's nothing about, no negatives in there. It's just all the how to move forward. I don't want to get too personal on that, but uh, the kids still have a relationship. I mean, you have seven kids. Mm -hmm. One of them was a, was a baby. Mm -hmm. The dad left then. Mm -hmm. How's the relationship with those younger those younger children? With their with, with their father. With their father. Now that they're all adults, they are going to navigate that, and mm -hmm. it's not easy. But you have a you broken them, heart. How did you help them navigate that through the time when they were six or seven or or ten years yeah. old? And that's you know that's a fascinating question because helping them navigate with their broken hearts, and then also trying to keep a bridge with someone who mm -hmm. isn't part of the household, it gets very complicated. And depending on the household and depending on the situation, it's different for everybody. Mm -hmm. And for some people, it's a, it's, it's a lot easier to you know have a rough year and then they kind of slide into a new normal. And then there's other people where it stays very rocky mm -hmm. for a very long time. And so that trauma brain that the mom and the kids are going through continues to happen over and over. Every phone call, every holiday, yeah. every time we have to go to court, every time somebody ages out, and so then there's another court situation. You may have to move, you may have to go get a different job, the finances change. So it's just a constant trauma. It's a constant heartache mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. needing to work through that. Well, one of the things you mentioned, and I think it's in uh, one of your practical to-do things, is to journal with your children. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, at what point did you pick that up where you're going to journal with the kids and, and tell us about that? Because yeah. it, it may help them express a lot of that underlying trauma. Because I have the seven, it's easy for me to look at how each child is wired differently. Mm -hmm. And so I have some extroverts like their mom, and then I have some very deep introverts. And then I have some kids that is like, it was hard for them to voice 
what they were feeling, sure. but they could write it. So I'm not sure where the idea came from, but I did get a blank book, and I just wrote in the front of it, and I said, this is for you and I to write back and forth in. Whatever you want to say, you can say it. Um, and I will not be checking for grammar or spelling <laughs> or handwriting. That's all, you know, That's this is all, all skate. You know, you get a get-out-of-jail-free card on that. And so I would write something to them, set it next to their bed. And sometimes I would get that book back and forth, and every day we would write back and forth. Occasionally, it would just sit for a while. They didn't have anything to say. And so then it would be kind of dusty, and then maybe somebody would then rewrite in it again. But I would get questions like, you know, why doesn't my dad love me? And what should we do for Christmas gifts this year? And how are we going to handle this holiday coming up? And so it was a lot easier for some of the kids to, to write it than to be able to talk it. When you're, when you're talking about that and, and the, uh, the children being able to trust you now, you're the leader of the family. How do you, how do you give them that confidence that uh, there's, there's no male in the house? There's no alpha male, mm -hmm. but you're, you're, and you're not playing both roles. You're the mom. Yeah, right. uh, you can't be the alpha no. male, but you can be the mom. How do you give them that, that trust? Because you deal with that, uh, it's still in the nurturing home chapter, but on page 66 where you talk about all the things you can do to give your child confidence that it's not the same, but it's going to be all right. Yeah, and I think one thing that's very important is for moms not to try to be mom and dad because they have a dad. They still have a dad. Yeah. He's responsible for his own role with them. And, you know, some of us are great parents and some of us could use a lot of help. Um, but the things that I thought were helpful for my children was, number one, to be as consistent as possible within our home. Because when you have kids that are bouncing from one place to another, there's different rules in different places. And they sort of have this issue where there's a, a pressure to almost create an attachment disorder because the weekend that you're with mom, you have these, you know, soccer yeah. practice and you have your toothbrush and you have your bedroom and you have these rules and these friends. And then when you go to another parent's house, you have a different toothbrush and the clothes that are there sometimes can't come back and the toys that are there can't come back. And so you have these kids that are having to say, I mean, they're doing what adults won't do, you know, doing this go back and forth thing. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard for them to learn how to have a relationship when they're having to, you know, just break off every week and do yeah. something different. And so I'm not saying that I have an answer for that. I'm just saying it's a hard, it's a very hard situation mm -hmm. for our kids. And I'm not sure that it's creating a healthy one. Um, but so that's why when I, when they were back home, the more consistent I could be, the better off for them so that they knew, okay, when we come here, this is how it always is. I can relax. Um, I also made sure that I wanted to introduce them to Jesus as soon as possible. And the reason for that is, even when I was sitting with my mentor one time, and I'm just crying like crazy and snotting and using up all of her Kleenex, and she said, what are you afraid of? And I'm like, I'm afraid I can't love them enough. I can't give uh -huh. them enough. Yeah. And she said, you can't. And I was like, oh, I knew it was terrible. And she said, no, no, no. She said, whether you're a single parent or whether you're dual parenting, you can't give them enough love because all of us have that place that we can only have filled by God and by God's love. So the fastest thing that I could do is to introduce them to Jesus as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. And so we did Bible time every night. And so we would read a chapter and then I would pray over the children. And then pretty soon as they could, they would pray out loud and we prayed youngest to oldest. And then we would start memorizing scripture and then we just, you know, kind of built it. And so in the back of the book, there's actually an appendix of the Bible mm -hmm. time that we did. And you can pick and pull from that if it helps yeah. you get started. But the important thing, family Bible time is reading scripture and prayer. And then I would pray pray blessings over them, which they loved. So the thing is just, can I give them that foundation? Because this is all about eternity. This is your source. Your source is not dad. Mm -hmm. It's not mom. It's actually God. So as soon as I could get them in that direction, that's where I wanted to point them. But did you overtly understand that, that you're going to set this tone in your house, this, this emotional tone and this spiritual tone? Or is it so chaotic that you just finally resolve yourself to that, that they're going to be, like you say, you've got some introverts, you've got some yeah. extroverts, but you've got to set the emotional tone in the home. You've got to yes. do that, right? Yeah. In fact, pretty much every mom does. Whatever mm. your situation is, pretty much mom sets the tone of the home. I'm not saying it's easy, mm -hmm. but it's kind of the truth. And so we get to choose what kind of home we want to raise our children in. And so for a lot of times when there is a divorce or separation, 
a lot of times there was a boundary that was put down because we're making a decision about what kind of home we want to yeah. raise our children in. And so the consistency was really important. Having We had like four or five just rules. These were the rules. You don't call somebody a name. You don't hit. You don't take something that's not yours because your things are your things. And so if a sibling wants, they have to get permission. And if they break it, they have to fix it or they have to replace it. And then there was also no deliberately disobeying mom and no lying. So those were the household rules. That was it. And so we just kind of like all you know, knew that that was where we were going to do as our foundation. And I remember one time I was, in the morning I was getting dressed and my kids were, I could hear some scrapping going on downstairs. And so I come to the top of the stairs and I'm like, hey, what's going on? And the, the baby, she's like four or five at the time, comes running over and she's standing at the bottom of the stairs and she looks up at me and she goes, Josiah called me a name. And I'm like, that's odd, you know, he doesn't normally do that. And I said, okay, what did he call you? He called me opinionated. <laughs> it's like... Well, that's not a name. That's the truth. <laughs> that's, so, yeah, that's so character. we had to do a lot of laughter. We had to have a lot of opportunity where, you know, you got your homework done, but you also had time to play and you had time to just relax. And you had time to read and you had time to be with your animals and you had time to play music. And, you know, what did we need to do to make the home peaceful? And then what could I do that would help the children know in this place you're gonna have this the home is an art studio for us. So you can explore, you can learn how to have relationships, we can talk about things and you can test things out, but this is your place yeah. and that you'll be safe here. And you, you've got, I mean, with seven, you had six in the home, right? With with when your husband All left? seven. You had seven yeah. at the time. Yeah. Uh, how old was the oldest? She was just starting work. She, she just was, had, was okay. 18. Yeah. So you've got some in the teens. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to set this tone and you're setting the, the emotional tone for the home and you've got the rules. They're all different. Yes. And they, they're, they're coming to those rules from the different locations and they're yes. coming from those, those rules with a different mindset and at different ages. How do you, how do you bring all that together? I mean, you can't sit down a, a one year old and a, and a 16 year old and give them the same rules and just explain it the same way. How do you translate that? And what do you do when the rules are broken with? a one-year-old or a 16-year-old? How do you yeah. balance all of that? The rules stayed the same no matter. Mm -hmm. The lying, how we treated one another, those things stayed the same regardless. There's consistency there. It was, yeah, because that's how you show respect to another human. And so we needed to learn that at home so then we could go out and do that elsewhere. And as far as, you know, like teaching it to one kid over another, because they have different personalities, sure. then... You know, with somebody, it needed to be a little bit stronger. And then with somebody else, it was a look across the room and they were like, I got it. So mm -hmm. it's finding out the different personalities of the kids. I had a couple of kids that if they were kind of clingy, they were fine. Mm -hmm. If they weren't clingy, I had to look into it. I had other kids that if they were clingy, there was a problem. Was a problem. And, you know, if they were off doing their thing, everything was great. Mm -hmm. That's parenting 101. You know, you did that with your kids. That's what we all do with our kids is just... How has God knit this person together? And it's not so much training as it's discovering who this person is and then allowing them to move forward into their full potential, into their calling and their anointing by the Holy Spirit into what God's already prepared for them to do. You can find Peggy Sue's book on Amazon and Christian online bookstores. Join me again next week on Viewpoint.